Hey everyone, Samantha here. Welcome to this week's episode of Trans IRL. I've been really looking forward to this one for a while and I'm really excited to share our guest story as well as a little bit of my own story. In tonight's episode, we'll be talking about surgical procedures and medical options. So it's important to take a moment now to talk through a couple of things for everyone who's, who's watching. So to start, although tonight's episode focuses on surgical options for transgender individuals, not all trans people will opt to undergo these procedures as part of their transition. And the need for surgical procedures to treat dysphoria or, or transition is not a requirement to being transgender at all. So surgeries don't make anyone more or less valid in this journey. Uh, number two, the information being presented tonight are the experiences of only two individuals out of thousands of people that have undergone gender confirming surgeries. So we're happy to share our own stories, but that's what they are, <laughs> our own experiences. Before going forward with any procedure, we ask, that, of course, that you collect as much data as possible in making any decisions. We must all advocate for ourselves and for the best care that we can get. And finally, we're, we're not medical professionals here, right? <laughs> Nothing discussed in today's episode should be taken as medical advice. It's only presented as reference material. So please don't make medical decisions based solely off of an internet show. <laughs> all right, still with us? Awesome. For first time viewers, please don't forget to check out our YouTube page for notifications whenever we go live and to check out our previously aired episodes. Our Instagram page over at Trans IRL is uh, home to where you can submit questions for our episodes before they air. So be sure to follow us over there as well. This week, we should be living, uh, uh, streaming live on Facebook as well. Uh, so if you have a chance, check out our Facebook page and uh, see what's going on over there. As always, we have Addison in the Trans IRL control room, and she's going to be monitoring the YouTube and Facebook chats tonight. So if you have any questions for me or for our guest or for Addison, please be sure to leave them in the chats and Addison will grab those and we may be able to answer some of those on air if we still have time. All right. With all that said, I do want to introduce our guest here tonight. Um, he's someone I've been following on Instagram for a while now, and I've really been impressed with his story and how open he's been about his own transition. So uh, when I reached out to him, I was really excited that he agreed to come on the show and talk to us a little bit about his journey. So at this point, I'd like to introduce Cameron to the show. Hey, Cameron. Hey, Samantha. Thank you so much for inviting me to come on. Yeah, thank you so much for joining us here. Uh, I'm really excited to, to share our stories here tonight. We're, we're talking gender affirming surgeries or gender confirmation type surgeries. And, you know, it's something that both of us have been through uh, as part of our journey. Um, I, I think between the two of us, we're, we're probably in double digits for <laughs> surgical procedures as part of this journey. Not quite for me, double digits yet, but... Um, uh, oh, combined, yeah, combined, I, I to, <laughs> combined surgery oh, count. Right. <laughs> okay. Yeah, I was telling someone the other day about how I was so nervous the first time I had surgery because I'd never undergone like anesthesia before because I'd never broke a bone shockingly as a kid. Uh, and so not ever having had a surgery before, I was really nervous about it. And now I'm just like, put me out. I'm used to it. <laughs> you get used to, you know, the anesthesia after a while. Yeah, I, it's, it's sort of a bad thing to become comfortable with, but it, it's kind of true, right? right? After the first couple of times you do it, you kind of get used to it. <laughs> like, all right, whatever. You get to sleep through the worst part of it. So I'd rather be knocked out than awake. So right, uh, if yeah. you could share a little bit about your, your own story, um, a little bit of your background, a little bit about you, whatever you feel comfortable sharing. Sure. Um, I won't bore you guys with too much of my history, but um, I am surprise, surprise, a middle child. Uh, there's five kids in my family growing up and I was smack dab in the middle. Um, that would be me in the picture that you're showing right now with the long hair and ribbons and dress. Don't I look super comfortable? <laughs> um, no, not really. Uh, my mom always dressed me in frilly dresses with ribbons and bows that I couldn't stand. Um, but uh, yeah, we grew up in a small town. My mother's from uh, Costa Rica and my father was from the United States. He was what he uh, referred to himself as a gringo. And my mom was in Costa Rica. They referred to themselves as if you're female, you're a Tika or male Tico. I don't know what they would, if you were non-binary or gender non-conforming, what the 
slang word would be. But nevertheless, um, my father met my mother and brought uh, my two older siblings to the United States. And then three more kids came after that. So grew up with a lot of siblings uh, and did a lot of stuff that my brothers did and the other neighborhood boys did. And I don't think it was until maybe like the third, fourth grade when I still wanted to like hang out in the swimming pool without a shirt on and swimming trunks so that I was told, you know, you have to put on a swimsuit because you're a girl. Um, I didn't like that, but uh, kind of learned that, oh, I guess I'm not like these boys like I felt like I was and I have to do what, well, in that case, my mom um, says. So fast forward, I just turned 38 uh, this week and I live in a different small town uh, in Oregon, in the United States, and I've been with my partner over 15 years. She and I have been together and we have a, she, she just turned our daughter uh, 15 in January. Um, that's awesome. So that's it's, it's always so great to meet other parents who are going through this process as well. And that's exciting that you've been together for 15 years. Congrats. Thanks. Yeah. Our kid keeps us on our toes. We're kind of a goofy family <laughs> and try to like, try to have fun as much as possible. So let's I'm talk so a little bit about that journey wife. for you then. Um, you know, you, you were with your, your partner prior to your transition. What was that process for you of, of coming to terms with, with your identity and, and how did you come out? Um, well, it was kind of a joke within our family, um, specifically my wife's family. Uh, she actually was in the military uh, she's she's no longer, but she was uh, when we first met in the Air Force. And it was back when it was don't ask, don't tell. And so um, I would write a male name like that. My packages were like being shipped to her. Uh, she was nervous about anyone finding out that she was getting chocolates and sweet notes and things like that from us uh, because at the time presented as female. And um so the joke was always that, uh, you know, it's not the name I now have, and, and interestingly enough, but um, we joked with family members that like, you know, if man, my name would be uh, Ken, like Barb and Ken. And uh, I, I dress like a guy as far as I remember. Um, and I don't really remember growing up like knowing anyone that was transgender um, or familiar with that term, really. And yeah, I think that's pretty similar for a lot of people in our age group, right? I mean, we we didn't have a lot of there were no trans role models when we were growing up, right? Um, Definitely no one available, you know, close by, especially. Right, and I wish I could say, hey, like I saw a particular show or I read this book or, you know, I have some frame of reference of that was the quote unquote, like epiphany or moment when I knew or something, but it was more, something must have triggered my curiosity and interest. And then I kind of, not kind of, I went down a rabbit hole of, you know, going on YouTube and reading uh, in groups and holy cow. Is a show that I can curse, so I'm going to make PG 13. <laughs> didn't know how, holy cow! <laughs> uh, I I didn't know it was people assigned female at birth who take hormones, and a lot of like in my 20s and even early 30s, I when I even thought like well, maybe I could transition into a guy, the idea of of getting like doing testosterone shots scared the bejesus out of me that i thought well if that's what you have to do then i get be a guy because i can't imagine like giving myself any kind of shots and then i realized oh there are things like gel and there are other types of ways that you can take testosterone uh if you're transitioning um, female to male or non-binary uh whatever you know if you're wanting to hormone replacement therapy in that 
hormone is testosterone. Um, and so I think knowing that it didn't have to be needles was kind of my, okay, let's do this. Uh, and that was like the summer of 2016. And I just uh, socially transitioned in the sense of cut my hair short, still wore the same kind of clothes I was wearing, uh, changed my name legally before I even came out to people at work. Uh, when I came out to my wife, going back to your original question, you know, she, um, there's a picture of me when I had changed my name. Uh, like I said, we've been together 15 years. And that's not to say that if you're with someone for 15 years, they're going to stay with you. But in our case, she loves me so much that she just wants me to be happy. And so um, then what happened in January of 2017 is that uh, in the county and state where I live in, you can change your name and simultaneously do a gender change or sex change uh, through court paperwork, or you could do them at two different junctures. And because I wasn't out to a lot of people and hadn't started hormones yet, I started just with just the name change, mostly transitioning a bit, and then started hormones uh, November, I think it was November 10th, 2016. And yeah, um, then multiple surgeries after that. So I don't know how, if you want me, I can just keep the hammer on if you don't well, stop me. But. Yeah, let's, let's, let's talk about it. No, let's, let's talk about surgical procedures. So just let's, let's laundry list what you've had done so far. <laughs> so I, I had top surgery in August of 2017. Um, so I think after I started and uh i still say like that was in terms of like dysphoria and binding and hating my chest so much like having top surgery was so freeing for me um i was so happy after having that had that done uh then after all the can you know gatekeeping what i mean by that is having to go to a therapist again to get another letter for a hysterectomy. I had that done in April of, well, it's 2019 now. So yeah, April of last year. Uh, I think that's, look at how awake I look there. I think that was the day of or the day <laughs> after. I'm um, having my, I don't look very thrilled, but um, that's probably that night in the ER. I ended up with a, blur, a bladder infection. And so that was uh, not a pleasant time. Um, and then the most recent surgery that I've had and um, probably what people have the most questions recently about and that likely we'll talk about more is uh, stage one phalloplasty. And specifically, I did RFF uh, radial forearm uh, phalloplasty flap. Radial forearm flap uh, is what the RFF stands for. That's my surgeon right there with me, Dr. Jens Burley. Uh, he does uh, gender surgeries out of uh, OHSU in Portland, Oregon. And for uh, stage one, which was uh, the creation of my phallus and creating the urethral lengthening, but it's not yet connected to my, my bladder. I'll have to sit to urinate uh, in stage two. It'll, it'll get connected amongst many other surgeries, um, but he does it in... A different staging than a lot of other popular uh, surgeons who sometimes do more things in stage one but Dr. Burley he will say this himself is more conservative so he likes to do less less procedures more time in between them giving you time to heal before moving on to the next if that makes sense so let's talk about that let's talk about why you picked your surgeon over any other surgeons that were available to do the the phalloplasty um for me it was simply due to the fact of location uh i i feel like i was lucky in that uh my insurance uh, it's called Kaiser Permanente. It's through my job, which is a government job. And um, it Kaiser Permanente doesn't have, through their program, a surgeon for phalloplasty. So they 
I don't know if contract through OHSU is the right terminology, but essentially that's who they refer uh, their patients to is um, to OHSU. And so I know some folks travel quite a ways to come to Dr. Burley and he's just an hour north of where I live. So kind of luck is the answer. Luck and my fortunate yeah, uh, there. <laughs> insurance. Yeah. I mean, I didn't even ask Kaiser Permanente, my insurance, if they covered anyone like, like Dr. Chen, for example, down in San Francisco, because I felt like I'd seen Dr. Burley's uh, post-surgery patients' phalluses, wow, that's a mouthful, um, on transbucket.com. And I, from what I had seen, I said, oh, that looks good to me. If that's what I end up looking like, I'd be happy with that. So um, like I said, it was I was fortunate that he's so close by. So for individuals who are having bottom surgery, uh, you know, going that direction where they're, they're having a phallus constructed, there are other options available than a full phalloplasty. Um, what was kind of your thought structure? What, what led you to like, yes, this is the procedure for me. This is what I want um, out of this procedure over other procedures. Right. So, so the two, uh, the two that I'm aware of that folks get is either metoidioplasty or phalloplasty if they choose to have bottom surgery. Um, and the difference being that with metoidioplasty, your current growth of your assigned female birth anatomy uh, stays and they create a, a scrotum. And so in terms of the certain abilities one would have after having metoidioplasty are limited depending on your own anatomy. And so uh, for me, I just knew I wouldn't be happy with uh, the size that I would be getting with metoidioplasty. And it's less likely that I'd been able to stand at a urinal to urinate if I had metoidioplasty. Some people can, if they have enough growth and their urologist and surgeon feel that they can attempt to uh, do uh, through the procedure, make it to where they can reroute their urethra. Uh, some folks can with metoidioplasty stand to pee, but I just, I didn't even ask my surgeon if it's a possibility because I know myself and I knew that I would want more length. And um, and have it be kind of a, a higher chance that I'd be able to stand to be, if that makes sense. Sure. So you, you had your surgeon, you, you figured that out. How long was the actual wait between the first time you reached out to OHSU and, and your surgery date? Oh, that's a good question. Um, so I... When I had received my letter, probably like November 2017, it was a letter from a therapist indicating that they uh, approved is not the right word, but that they help me out, Samantha. They recommend they accepted. Um... <laughs> they, yeah, they after talking with me. Um, <laughs> For the for the white path insurance, I to think of the terminology. I feel like it's a letter of recommendation, but it's. I think folks know referral. What I'm about. Anyway, the letter. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like a referral letter saying, he really is trans, and he really w does want to have, um, you know, bottom surgery, and part of that was both a, uh, hysterectomy and phalloplasty, and so. I contacted OHSU and learned this is the letter that I had received. Actually, I think that's the letter. I can't remember. I'm looking at my face and thinking that might have been early on in my transition. The photo um, that's flashing now, I think, is for my when I wanted to have top surgery. Um, but nevertheless, same type of letter was needed for me to have both a hysterectomy and phalloplasty. And so... Um, they said there is a informational like educational class that the OHSU puts on and, and we would be coming to talk about phalloplasty and metoidioplasty because that early on 
even I was like, I'm not sure the differences between the two. And I don't know 100% that I want phalloplasty. So the first step is to go to that class, which is free, and sit there for two, three hours and, and listen and be educated about the different procedures. And that happened, um, uh, I think, around December 2017. And um, then I had my hysterectomy in April. And I knew from going to that class that I would have to, if I was having the, the phalloplasty uh, procedure and I wanted all three stages, which I did, that I would need to have a hysterectomy. And so that was kind of the first stepping stone toward even scheduling my stage one. So again, that was April okay. 2018. And then shortly thereafter, you know, I was calling OHSU saying, okay, check hysterectomy you now when can i get a consultation with dr burley and that happened in june or july of last year and he actually has his patients see him twice uh just the first is to discuss the type of procedure you're going to have uh, knowing that i wanted it for my forearm he you know checked the uh, veins and arteries and made sure that from what he could tell i had blood flowing properly through my arm because that would then be my phallus and wants to make sure that when he puts it on there, it stays on there, that blood's flowing to it. Um, and then the second consultation was in like just a couple months later. Not everybody gets it that kind of back to back, like I lucked out and ended up getting, but I think somebody, there was a cancellation or something. So I got in that second consultation fairly quickly in August again of 2018 and initially after that they said okay we've got you scheduled for april 2019 and well it's march of 2019 and i had it done in january and that's because back in december they contacted me and said hey pretty short notice but we had a cancellation so do you want to come in january instead of april and i said yes i do <laughs> um so the gentleman that was going to be having his stage one in January, there was a hiccup with his insurance. So essentially, he took my April date and I took his January date. So January 7th is when All I right. just had my stage one. So let's talk about the actual procedure itself. Uh, you go in, you, you have the procedure, um, you wake up. Uh, what, what are those first feelings that you have when you come out of surgery? I was hungry. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm the type of person who eats uh, frequently, maybe not necessarily a lot, but I snack all the time. Like my coworkers and family members joke about how I'm just like a big kid because I always have fruit snacks or you know, trail mix or something. I'm always needing to have some type of food. And so for me, um, I going into surgery that morning i remember dr burley just confirming it's your left arm right or correct uh because that's your non-dominant arm and he talked to me about a few other things and then he said any is there any questions you have cameron and i my first my only question was when will i be able to eat will i be able to eat tonight <laughs> because it was an eight nine hour procedure and i remember being bummed when he said i'm sorry buddy but trust me you're gonna you won't even know that you want to eat um but tomorrow you could eat so i just remember waking up feeling like oh i really wish i could eat um <laughs> i know it sounds like a weird thing but uh i i just trusted him and his team so much that i wasn't i wasn't worried about my body as much as i was like just wanting to put food in my stomach <laughs> So, I mean, I know when you wake up from surgery, you're, you're for, for me, you know, you're pretty out of things for, for a little while. Um, you know, you, you sort of have that twilight as you're coming up and everything's wearing off. Oh, uh, look, there's me. Yeah, I know asleep, that look. Apparently. Yeah. Yeah, that's, this is actually a surgery recovery picture for me. Uh, this is after I got out of the hospital. But uh, there's, there's me going into to surgery um, when, when I had my bottom surgery. And... Waking up, there we go. There's a, <laughs> a very somber looking me, but a very happy looking me too. 
Um, and, and those first those first thoughts of, of coming out of surgery were just very, I uh, was just ecstatic, euphoric, you know, coming out. Um, but that sort of wears off in a couple hours when the pain really kicks in for the first time. <laughs> and and there is a lot of they pain, or at least I had a lot of pain uh, to start. Um, I'll, I'll let you tell your story a little bit. Oh, I was just going to say, they must have given me enough pain medication because my initial feelings, even for the first couple days, I don't remember like feeling pain anywhere. I think that surprised me. I think I was anticipating to be that my arm would be really hurting or my bottom area. Uh, but I was fortunate in whatever <laughs> types of medication they'd given me. Um, I wasn't really feeling painful as much as I was feeling uh, after probably two or three days, I started to feel that bloated uh, constipation feeling that's never fun. Uh, but that's just due to the the opiates, I think, that they give you. It causes you to be constipated. Right. So. Did, did you have to do any sort of a, a colon cleanse before um, surgery or anything like that? Another reason why I feel so blessed and thankful is because I, I can't imagine doing that. I've seen videos of other uh, folks who have to do that like the day before. So they don't eat like that whole right. day or that <laughs> night. For me, at least with Dr. Burley and, and other surgeons for both my hysterectomy and my top surgery, their only requirement uh, in terms of eating was... Uh, I joked and told my friends, like, I'm like a gremlin. Um, I can't eat after midnight. So <laughs> my wife would make me a big meal and and it never failed at like 1130 before I'd go to sleep the night before surgery. I would go and like eat as much as I could just because I knew I couldn't eat all morning and I wouldn't have been able to eat like the morning of. Uh, but no, I did not have to do that. So I'm sorry for folks who've had to do that. And I don't know why some <laughs> surgeons have folks do that. And because well, when other people hear that, they're like, what? You didn't have to. <laughs> nope. I just couldn't eat after midnight. You know, I'm, I'm not thing. sure what the, the reasoning is behind that. We, we need a doctor on here to answer why. Why do you make some of us go through this terrible <laughs> cleanse prior to surgery? Right. It's, it is not fun at all um, from experience. <laughs> I'm sorry. I'm sorry you had to go through that. So. So let's let's talk about um, you know your your recovering um, and you know it's interesting with with your procedure. Of course, they they do require that that donor skin uh, from your arm there. So in reality, you have two surgical sites coming out of this procedure. Yes, and I also opted for uh, a material called Integra, which. At least as far as my surgeon explained it to me, it is made out of shark cartilage and protein from cows. I don't know, but it is essentially uh, a sheath or sheath sheet. I don't know a material that went the tissue from my arm to create the phallus. Uh, without the Integra, they would have just same day, same lump of procedures would have taken in my leg graft skin and put it over my arm. But because I opted for the Integra, what ended up happening is they put the Integra over my arm, nothing happened on my leg, and then three weeks, it was about two and a half weeks later, I came back and they peel what looks like, because Dr. Burley took a video of it, um, and I should have sent that to Addison because she could have shown it on the screen right now. But <laughs> if you could just imagine somebody taking, it sounds kind of gross, but I guess people did get the trigger warning. We're talking about surgery stuff. But if you imagine my arm looks like three day old sweet and sour sauce, meaning like it's a really bright reddish color and then peeling off like saran wrap, um, which is just the outside coating of the Integra in the course of uh, two more weeks my capillaries and I don't know, all the things inside of your body underneath the skin kind of form into that Integra. And then I had a second surgery where they put the skin graft over it. Um, and the reason I chose to do that is I had seen somebody on Instagram 
who his arm looked really good. And I said, wow, you took really good care of your arm. Can I ask if you happen to have Integra? And he said, yes, uh, my insurance covered it. And aesthetically, I, this is him saying like, I chose to go through a second surgery because I was willing to do my best to make it look more aesthetically pleasing for him, just for himself. And I thought, you know, even though maybe later down the road in two, three years, I thought about getting a tattoo. If for some reason I don't, like, I'm not afraid to get another surgery and try to make it be as aesthetically pleasing um, on my own arm. So my insurance. So it's, it's been it two months pleasing. now since yep. you had surgery. How, I mean, I, I've seen your posts on Instagram. You, you're wearing a compression sleeve to help with that recovery. How is the recovery going overall on your arm? Um, it's great. Uh, I mean, I have one little baby, uh, I don't know if you can see it very well, scab that's left over right here. And then one right there that I anticipate in the next day or two will end up coming off. Uh, and usually I have a glove over this, uh, or not a glove, a glove over my hand and a compression sleeve over my arm. But um, I've had it on all day today. I've, I've seen a lot routine. of... Um forearms after surgery that looks amazing for two months that's incredible oh, thank you yeah my occupational therapist was you know i don't know how to comp compare it other than what i you know i see on on instagram and so right. uh, while i'm very pleased with it i wouldn't know unless i saw 17 other posts you know two months post with people with integra but um yeah i'm very thankful that it's healing pretty well and um, getting a little less tight and more uh, mobility every day when I uh, do my exercises. So, yeah. So how has, how has the pain been for, for the actual lower surgery then for the fallow? Um, how has that recovery been for you? Well, Dr. Burley has his patients stay at the hospital for five to seven days. And I was there six and a half days. He does that because the very, like the first 24 hours, Samantha, it was the most bizarre thing. Well, like you said, first of all, you're kind of still drugged up. <laughs> so, you know, in terms of like you're being lucid uh, or, or not, um, it just kind of feels like a weird dream because, uh, oh, there, that's what I look like. Um, actually, that's after top surgery, but it's the same face, you know, where you kind of just look half awake. <laughs> um, <laughs> right. And yeah. And so the because of um, all the blood that needs to flow in and out of your new phallus, they have what they call a Doppler check where they bring in a little machine that's next to your bed and press it on the phallus until they can hear like, I'll make the sound. Like, it's kind of like this swooshing sound. Um, and they just want to make sure that they can hear that because that means your penis is still a lot, you know, like there's blood flowing <laughs> in and out like it should be. <laughs> and, and they keep it propped up at a, a 90 degree angle, like straight up with like gauze all around it. Uh, the joke at OHSU is they call it a penis cloud because your mesh underwear, like they cut a hole in it and then they prop it on <laughs> your new friend with like gauze all around it. So just at a glance, it just looks like a cloud of gauze. So they call it the penis cloud. Um, and so that first night, I mean, every single hour, I don't know with your surgeries, like if they, how often they check on you, but they want to make sure that thing is staying on you. So they're doing that Doppler test once an hour, checking my temperature, checking my blood pressure. So I didn't get much sleep. Um, and, but I didn't have a ton of pain. Luck, luckily I felt very fortunate, um, that again, the only like pain, those seven, six and a half days in the hospital was just like discomfort from not being able to go to the bathroom number two. And I just got used to people poking and prodding at me, sometimes a whole room full of them because with it being a university some of the folks in the room are like students and so they're observing the the surgeons and the uh, residents and it wasn't until 
And I came home and I felt great and I felt fine. I did have to lie flat for four weeks, which I knew going into it that that would get old after a while, but it is what it is. And I just had to mentally prepare for that. Um, it was when I went back two and a half weeks later and had the, the leg to, to arm skin graft that unfortunately the day and a half after I came home from that surgery, I didn't have to stay at the hospital at all. Um, that was a day surgery. Then I came home the same day. My leg really started to hurt and to the point where I couldn't like walk to the bathroom. Um, because although I had to lie down flat for four weeks, the exception was, of course, if I needed to stand up, walk to the restroom, sit down to use the restroom, but then it's back lying down. But I couldn't get to the bathroom even without having my wife come put my, you know, me put my arm around her. And I was literally hobbling to the bathroom and felt a mm. lot of pain in my leg. And he did tell us, you, you know, that's an open, a big open wound on your leg. So it's going to seep some stuff. And so don't worry about it. That's normal. Um, and so when it was seeping stuff, I won't be too graphic. It's gross. But I just thought, well, he kind of warned me this might happen. But then a day after it hurting so much, I ended up with a fever uh, through the night. And um, with the fever and some pictures that I took and sent to Dr. Burley, he said, yeah, I'm worried you might have an infection. So that was a Sunday. He said, come up to our emergency room. He's like, your hospital where you live, they're not going to know what to do with you. Um, but come up, you know, drive you an hour up here and we'll, we'll clean up your area and we'll see how you're doing. And he did notice at that time that uh, there was some bacteria, but he didn't prescribe me antibiotics. And then I had my normal, like scheduled, already scheduled appointment with him two days later in which I was still hobbling and in a lot of pain and he said okay well it's not getting better so yes i'm gonna give you antibiotics after i took antibiotics for a day i was fine um so i might like hold a little resentment like come on doc you could have given that to me on sunday but <laughs> you know he was i guess he thought unless it gets worse there was no need but um anyway so that was that was the only bad part in terms of like there being pain through the that first stage process and i have told people and all i've said it on my youtube channel i'll say it again if that's all that's going to happen is like for a few days i can't walk and i cry crawling up the stairs because it hurts so bad <laughs> but i still have my phallus and my arm still works and with antibiotics my leg was then that i could i could i would do that all over again um, but that, that did, that's, um, I'm not gonna lie. Yeah, it doesn't sound very fun. And what did you say your second stage is scheduled for? I just found out today, um, because they had to reschedule and it is scheduled for July. I want to say the 12th. It's a Friday, mid July. We'll just say that. All right. Cause I'll be, yeah. So I'll, um, go back and. I don't know if you want me to give detail on all the different procedures they do then. I can. It's up to you. What it. you want to share. Oh. Yeah. Um, so, like I said, with the first stage, he lengthened my urethra through my phallus. Stage two, that will get connected to my bladder. They'll also put, also put a catheter in, though, as things heal. So for... I'm not sure how many weeks, but I'll be toting around a, a bag uh, with urine in it. So that's fun. Um, <laughs> but other things, that's so that's the most exciting part about stage two for me personally is that piece. Um, but they'll also, uh, I don't know the right way to say this other than just speaking slang and just saying close my front hole. Um, the actual procedure, I believe, is called a vaginectomy vaginectomy yeah i think so uh scrotal scrotum plasty the creation of a scrotum and oh glands plasty okay i'm excited about that part too i'm creating the glands or the head of the phallus um, 
So all of those pieces, a lot of little pieces um, in stage two. But the recovery, I think, is just a couple of days in the hospital versus staying there a whole week. So that's good. Right. It's not as not as intensive or as uh, invasive as the, the first stage is. Right. It's, I think for me, the part that I'll be a little anxious about is, like you said, it's not as invasive, but there are so many like moving parts um, in terms of all the things that they're going to be doing. It just seems like a lot could go wrong. Let's knock on wood here. Um, but <laughs> but yeah, hopefully it's fine and I recover well. And yeah, these, these procedures are intense, you know, uh, for, for, for either of us, uh, for trans feminine individuals, trans masculine, or other people who choose to undergo these, these affirming type procedures, they're, they're not simple. There's a reason that there's only a handful of doctors in the world that perform these procedures well. Um, there are a lot of steps and there's a lot of opportunity for complications in there as well. So it's, it's good that your doctor is on top of things and obviously you know very involved in your recovery, which is always good to hear, but um, it's one of the risks we take on going through this process. We, we know the risks going into it, but uh, I don't wanna speak for everyone, but for me, you know, the, the potential outcome is worth the risks that we put ourselves in. It's, uh, we, we take this on because we want to be complete. We want to be who we are. How so thank you for you sharing. Uh, oh yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. Oh, it's okay. I was just going to ask, um, how long you had to stay in the hospital, the, the photos that, um, that you were showing. For that procedure, were you yeah. Let me. I'll actually. I'll. I'll talk a little bit about my story here. Thank you for sharing yours. Um, and I'll kind of walk through my my bottom surgery story as as well. Um, so going back earlier in my transition, uh, actually before I even came out to to anybody, I was already doing research online uh, about, um, you know, how how do how does someone transition? You know, what are the what are the steps that that can be done. What would this look like if I actually move forward to it? So I was actually researching uh, surgeon and surgical options before before I was out to anybody. Um, and as part of my transition, I've actually had five total surgeries, and that that should be it. I don't, I'm not expecting any more at this point. But um, just a real quick summary of of what I've had done. Uh, the first surgery I had was a rhinoplasty. I actually still had that. I had that surgery before I was presenting uh, femme at all. Uh, I actually ended up having a revision rhinoplasty as well. So this this photo is from the the revision. Um, so one thing that you don't hear a lot of um, is that with rhinoplasty there is a very high rate of revision because uh, the nose has funny ways of wanting to heal. So um, keep that in mind if rhinoplasty may be on your agenda at some point in the future. That's actually the first one there. That was the first rhinoplasty where I was still uh, pretty much in guy mode all the time, uh, but I, I knocked that surgery out first. That was something I was very dysphoric about. Oh, look at me <laughs> waking up there. Oh. But uh, that was the first procedure. After that, I was in South Korea for vocal surgery. And that was about five or six months on hormones. So there I am in my fancy little Yisan uh, robe for surgery. And that procedure wasn't too terrible from a pain perspective. Um, really, you wake up with a, a sore throat. Uh, but the, the downside with focal surgery is you can't speak for 30 days afterwards. So that was a little bit of a struggle. Um, after vocal surgery, I had the uh, revision rhino. And then I had uh, gender confirmation surgery. So uh, in my case, that is the construction of what you would expect uh, to see in any natal female. So that's the construction of uh, vulva, vagina, clitoris, uh, correct urethral placement in there. It's, it's, it's everything. So here's a great picture of me with my surgeon. And I went to go see Dr. Marcy Bowers out of Burlingame, California for my procedure. So taking a step back from there, talking a little bit about picking out a surgeon, um, you know, it, it was something I took very seriously. And I think with any confirming surgery or, or any surgery for that matter, we need to be really uh, our, our own advocates uh, in, you know, who we who we see. Uh, I knew from a, you know, insurance standpoint that I would probably be going to a U.S. surgeon who who took my my insurance plan. 
Uh, so that, that did narrow me down to about three or four surgeons. Uh, but ultimately, I, I liked the work that Dr. Bowers uh, was doing. And, and the, this is kind of a funny story, but uh, I we actually sat down, Laura and I would sit down at night and pull up <laughs> results for surgeons and, uh, you know, compare them and, and try to, you know, make a, a choice that made the most sense. Uh, but it's a very surreal feeling to kind of sit on the couch next to your spouse and be evaluating surgical results um, in, in the hopes of, of helping you narrow down your, uh, your choice for a surgeon. So I, I did actually have uh, two consults um, total, uh, but, but chose uh, Bowers for surgery. Uh, so the first step in that process was getting on uh, her wait list. And for uh, you know, this procedure, most of the surgeons here in the US and, and overseas have wait lists that you uh, need to get on before you're, you're able to, to get surgery. Um, in my surgeon's case, she has a wait list. I think currently it's somewhere around the three to four year mark. But I also knew that she had a cancellation list for people who are able to get to her quickly um, if, if an opening opens up in the schedule. So I put myself in the cancellation list very early on in the hopes that uh, there would be an opening in her schedule and I'd be able to get in sooner. And um, that waiting period gave me a chance to actually go get my letters completed. It gave me a chance to uh, do hair removal in the surgery site. So this is something that comes up a lot right now uh, with these uh, trans feminine surgeries is hair removal. Uh, actually, I think this comes up for the guys too, uh, depending on, on their arm, um, if they're gonna do any electrolysis to, to remove hair on their arm before uh, fallow. But uh, for uh, my surgeon recommends hair removal prior to surgery. So I ended up doing laser and electrolysis in the surgery site, which is not a very comfortable uh, procedure to, to undergo, but important because, um, you know, at, at a very high level, you know, what's on the outside becomes what's on the inside. So um, if there's hair on there, you, you definitely don't want that inside of you. Certain surgeons, uh, or actually all surgeons that, that I'm aware of use the scraping method as well to, to scrape follicles. Uh, but some surgeons may or may not recommend um, additional hair removal just as a precaution. So uh, of course, depending on the surgeon that an individual chooses, you may or may not hear that requirement for additional hair removal. Um, after insurance was squared away, hair removal was complete. I actually did get a call for surgery uh, that a date had opened up for me. And that was in March. Well, I got the call in January. At the very end of January, 2018, I got the call and they offered me a date about six weeks away. So uh, my surgeon isn't here in my home state. Um, it's about an hour and a half flight over from Phoenix to San Francisco. So I had to buy a plane ticket. I had to get uh, somewhere to stay for recovery um, in the area. And, you know, these are expenses that were at the time out of pocket, um, but, you know, important to, to take care of there. So book the plane ticket, get the Airbnb. I had to do some final blood work prior to surgery. I had to do an EKG and uh, get all that squared away, get that over to the office prior to uh, my surgery date. So um, from there, I had a pre-op appointment with her and, and basically we, we just kind of went over, you know, what the procedure would entail. Um, of, of course, there's, there's a whole list of questions you, you run through as part of this procedure. Um, I, I don't feel like I need to say it, but um, as a doctor, she has to inform you that, you know, this, this surgery will sterilize you. Um, which, yeah, I, I gathered that, but I thought she asked, you know, if I had uh, banked any uh, material uh, prior to surgery. And for, for those who, who know, and, and maybe those that don't, I, I have four kids already. So I was, I was set there. There was uh, <laughs> no reason for, for any uh, storage there. I'm, I'm good on the kid front. Uh, going into surgery was uh, pretty nerve wracking, I'd say. Um, the day before actually was the that colon cleansing day that, that we had talked about a little bit earlier. So they they do put you in a liquid diet uh, those 24 hours before surgery, and uh, then they they give you the this laxative. And the name is escaping me right now. Someone will remember in the chat. Maybe Addison can shout it at me. I don't know, but uh, that is not a fun experience. <laughs> uh, but it does clean you out and. Um, especially with this surgery and, and all the work that's done down there. I, I know that part of the reason why they, they do this is so that 
you're not passing anything for uh, at least a few days after surgery to kind of just let everything down there settle down because it's a very invasive procedure. Um, at surgery though, um, you know, I felt confident going in that morning and, and waking up uh, was really a special feeling. Um, for me, you know, the dysphoria that I felt prior to surgery was intense. And it became more intense as my transition went on, um, especially as other things changed, as my appearance changed on hormones, as my voice changed, um, you know, still having, you know, what I was born with was very detrimental to me. It, it affected me uh, every, every moment I was awake. I, you know, it was just a constant reminder that I wasn't complete, or at least I wasn't uh, who I needed to be. So waking up was a really, uh, just a freeing moment. Um, <laughs> uh, there's me uh, walking around the, the hospital there. They, they actually keep you in the hospital. It was three days basically where you're just in bed before they finally get you up and you can walk around a little bit. And uh, I, I will say though that, you know, that the pain is, is pretty intense at times. They, they do a really good job of managing it there. Um, there is also those nurse checks like Cameron was alluding to you know, like every hour, you can't get sleep because they're always coming to poke you or check on you or take your temperature or check your packing or check your drains or whatever else is part of their routines, which is good that they're, you know, so engaged in your health and well-being, but it's really bad for when you're actually just trying to get some sleep. So after those first three days in the hospital, they actually send you uh, back to your hotel or in my case, Airbnb. So here, here's me crashed um, at the Airbnb. Uh, at this point, though, I, I actually still had a catheter in, uh, and that catheter would stay in until about day seven. And uh, there was also packing inside the, the new vagina as well. So on day seven, you actually go back, uh, take the catheter out, they take the packing out, and there in the office is the first time you dilate. And for those who may not know, dilating is part of the therapy of, of caring for a, a new vagina after surgery. And, and that basically involves a, a medical stent um, that's that's placed inside the canal for a certain period of time to help it remain open and to help your body just get used to having uh, that there. So that's an important part of recovery. It's important that um, you do that as your doctor requires because it will uh, make sure that you're able to maintain your, your depth and, and diameter down there as well. Uh, it's not very fun but it's an important part of surgery. So after that, um, I think we spent another 24 hours or so in the San Francisco area, just to make sure there were no uh, major complications. And then I flew back home. So that was my experience in a nutshell. I will say this though, um, you know, we, we talked about it a little bit, Cameron brought it up, uh, complications, right? Complications are something that we need to be aware of uh, in any medical procedure. And uh, for me, I did have uh, two little hiccups, not major complications, but uh, two things that uh, I, I had to call the surgeon about to make sure everything was okay. Uh, first thing was about 11 days after surgery, I actually popped a stitch. Um, and I was, you know, concerned about that. Um, so I, I, I spoke to the surgeon about that and, and she just confirmed that, um, you know, it's actually a fairly common complication. As long as there's not excessive bleeding or anything like that, it should heal just fine. And, and that's exactly what it did. I also had a very small hematoma that started bleeding about two weeks after surgery, which was just a collection of blood, um, which was surprising, uh, but it actually cleared up on its own. Uh, you know, I know in speaking with other individuals who have undergone this procedure, it does seem like it's very hard to get out of this surgery without having any complications. I, I think that's actually um, outside the norm um, if you're able to, to get out of it scot-free without anything. So one thing I always tell people, you know, that are getting into this <laughs> procedure is, you know, expect something, right? Um, it's a complicated procedure. It's an intense procedure. And the recovery is, is fairly long as well. Um, after spending that week there in San Francisco after surgery, uh, I was off work for six weeks recovering. I wasn't flat on my back, but it was still a long recovery. It was a long road, um, just uh, very difficult to sit down. Um, as you can imagine, everything's just sort of tight and sore down there for, for quite a while. 
and there's just a lot of uh, lingering pain. Uh, you, you just don't have a ton of mobility. You can kind of shuffle your way around the house, um, but you're, you're not doing too much uh, during that recovery period. And it did take me, like I said, about six weeks before I felt mostly human again after after the procedure. Uh, but I will say now, I'm actually about a week away from being a year post-op, and I'm I'm very happy with with the results. Um, I, I know uh, Cameron's still early in, in his recovery, and he has still has a couple other stages. But I you know I can say that after the procedure, I'm orgasmic, um, and everything works as it's intended to work. So from that standpoint, I'm I'm extremely satisfied and and you know just thrilled that I was able to have the opportunity to undergo this procedure. So with all that said, I'll bring Cameron back on. And we actually have quite a few questions that were submitted by uh, the audience that they were interested in us answering. So why don't we get to some of those here and answer some of them. So our first question here, what were your best sources of information when researching surgeons and options? I know for me personally, uh, Reddit was really important uh, at first. Uh, Cameron, you mentioned Transbucket, which is another really interesting website where people post their results. Where, where else did you look? Yeah, uh, yeah so I went uh, there as well as joined at least a half a dozen uh, Facebook groups um, that were about, like, uh, I think there was various names. So some are like FTM bottom surgery or uh, trans folks bottom surgery, phalloplasty discussion, you know, they have various names and depending on, you know, the moderators for the group, uh, it might be trans men and women and non-binary folks. And some were strictly uh, female to male uh, trans men who were in those groups. And what I think was the most valuable to me personally was that going that educational class that I spoke about, they told us about an OHSU bottom surgery group specifically. And that is where a lot of the post, uh, post surgical trans guys uh, who had gone to Dr. Burley were able to speak about their experiences and uh, sometimes share photos and just talk about everything about recovery and supplies and what to expect and what they're, you know, different people recover different ways. And so I learned a lot about what could happen and um, it helped me just prepare mentally uh, being a part of that particular Facebook group. Right. And it's, it depends. Some surgeons do have information posted on their website as well. So, so even some surgeons have photos posted and results posted. You just have to, to check them out. All right, let's take a look at our second question yeah. here. What are the most important questions to ask a prospective surgeon? Ooh. Cameron, I'll let you start on this one. Okay. I think it depends on you as the individual. So it sounds like with you, Samantha, you're the type of person who really likes to research and know as much as possible. <laughs> whereas I'm, I'm absolutely a Pisces. <laughs> I'm a dreamer. I'm a little bit more uh, go. I, I don't know. I don't know how to phrase it uh, other than to say, because my expertise isn't the medical field, it's, you know, social services and uh, helping. Uh, I didn't know anything about uh, going into these uh, consultations, what types of questions I should or shouldn't ask. And so where some people may look on the tell me exactly what you're taking and where it connects and how it connects and some of those intricacies, whereas I'm just like, I don't need to know or care to know. I trust you, you're a surgeon. Tell me more. So for me, the questions I wanted to know more about was uh, what my caregiver, like the expectations essentially for me was my wife, like what does my wife need to know? How much time does she need to take off work? When can I get back to work? Um, if there are complications, like what might that, what are those possible complications? And so I think for me personally, it was less about the, the how and more of the like what ifs and the to do's after the fact, um, I'd already seen and knew like a bunch of results. So while he did show me pictures, 
I had already seen pictures, like I said, being part of some of those groups and going to trans bucket. But um, for me, it was like, you know, how am I going to recover and how's my wife going to help me to recover were some of my most pressing questions. Yeah, I think you covered all the good stuff there. I'd say the only other thing that comes to mind for me is just being able to readily see results and to know if you are going to continue to have good access to the surgeon after the procedure as well. Um, you know, the last thing you want is to come out of this major procedure and not be able to, um, you know, reach your surgeon or, or anything like that. So you want to make sure that the aftercare portion is just as important as the, you know, surgery itself. That was important for me. <laughs> yeah, that, that right. is a question I asked. Let's look at our that next was one. important for me too. Oh. All right. Did your bottom dysphoria get worse after starting HRT? Uh, mine definitely did. <laughs> Um, I, I know that starting hormones and starting this process um, kind of brings the whole transition to the forefront, right? Um, and the more you think about it um, and the further you progress, uh, for, for me, yeah, um, starting this process, presenting female, uh, wearing feminine clothing, there were a lot of reminders of what still wasn't exactly how I wanted it to be going through this process. So as time went on, dysphoria definitely got worse. Um, it became harder to manage. And, you know, I'm, I consider myself fairly lucky. I was able to move up uh, on my timeframe for surgery. Um, I know not everyone has that option, but uh, even for the amount of time I waited, I still waited over a year. Um, that was hard. It was hard to, to wait, especially not knowing if I was ever going to get that call or not that, hey, there's a cancellation here. So definitely for me. How about you, Cameron? I'm glad it got moved up for you. Uh, it sounds like you and I both kind of just had like a month and a half to to prepare. But when you get that call, it's like, yes, I felt like I won the lottery, you know. <laughs> um, right. So for me, just knowing, I guess myself, because I've been on this planet for, you know, at the time, 35 years as I started to transition, I told myself to be patient because I'm generally impatient. And so what I mean by that is like when I started HRT, I told myself, dude, just be glad when you get a few mustache hairs and just be grateful <laughs> when you have a, a little bit of a deeper voice. And so with each little change, I just tried to remind myself to be grateful and be patient for more changes to come. And even now, like being just over two years on T, I know that there's still going to be more like physical changes and I've I'm looking forward to some of those. I don't know about this receding hairline, but um, <laughs> I, you know, after starting T, it was kind of like, uh, let's get let's get my passport changed, and let's focus on that goal. And then it was okay. I'm gonna have top surgery, so I've got to go see this therapist. So I, I guess what I'm trying to say is, instead of the big picture, I always focus on like the next goal. And while I was dysphoric about my whole body. I tried not to let it um, affect me and just focus on knowing that like one day I will have the chest that's here on the right, you know, I'll have a flat chest. And so it was so helpful for me to have like friends and people that I met on online and on Instagram who I could see maybe had a little fluffier hips like that picture just showed of me with my larger chest than when I was binding. And then it shows them, you know, two to five years down the road, uh, looking much more quote unquote masculine and knowing that, okay, that'll be me. I just got to take it one thing at a time. So when my bottom dysphoria specifically, I think got, was more prominent was after my hysterectomy, because for me, it was after top surgery, I felt so awesome that I was able to kind of float on that euphoria for a while, that gender euphoria that uh, the hysterectomy was like that stepping stone to then later getting phalloplasty. And after the hysterectomy in April, knowing that like potentially I wasn't going to have surgery for like another whole year. Yeah, I had pretty intense bottom uh, dysphoria because that was my next step. Um, yeah. But like I said, at the very beginning starting T, I wasn't as focused. I don't think I even knew initially like that I'm for sure going to have bottom uh, surgery because uh, I wasn't initially oh, okay. bottom dysphoria. Um, but yeah, 
when you get other things done and you feel like, okay, that piece is complete and I want to feel whole down there too, um, <laughs> that's when it But you, you sound way more patient than I ever was. I am such an impatient person in general, but I'm glad you brought up uh, the support we have from our community, right? So on those really bad dysphoric days, I was lucky that some of the relationships I've made with other people in the community through Instagram or Reddit or here locally, you know, I was able to lean on them. Uh, whether those are people that have been through this procedure already or people who are in a similar situation that I'm in now, I think that was really important to have that social network to kind of help support me through those moments where, you know, I was getting getting down about that. I mean, that's that's what friends are for, right? <laughs> is, is supporting us through yeah. tough times. Definitely. All right, let's take a look here at the next one. And were you ever worried it was something you'd regret? <laughs> I do have a, a very short story here. Um, I, I mean, it, it's very exciting to, to get the call that you're going to get surgery. And um, there was just, just about two weeks before surgery, actually a little bit less, like 10, 12 days before surgery, I did have like a minor freak out, like, oh my gosh, this is actually happening. I know this is happening, it's coming up. I can't believe this is happening. And I, I don't want to say that I, I was worried that I was going to regret it, but more like just this daunting feeling of, oh my gosh, this recovery and the dilating and everything else that comes with it. Uh, I mean, that was really weighing on me. Uh, but something happened that sort of put it all in perspective. Uh, my surgeon actually ended up falling and uh, getting a hairline fracture uh, like a week before surgery. She had a hairline fracture in, in her lower lumbar. And, um, you know, we get this call that, that maybe surgery is going to have to be pushed out uh, be because of her injury. And all of a sudden, you know, this thing that I've been waiting for and uh, had been looking forward to, it looked like it was going to be taken away from me. And in that moment that, oh, oh my gosh, this might not happen. I, I might get bumped for, for who knows how long. I might have to wait another, you know, who knows how long here. That that was terrifying to me that, you know, this wasn't going to happen. And I know that's sort of a, a strange occurrence and a strange thing to have happen, but that sort of put it in perspective to me like, okay, yeah, I've got some nerves about this, but no, I absolutely need this and I absolutely, uh, you know, need, need this now. Luckily uh, for, for my, my surgeon and for her patient, um, you know, it was a very small uh, injury that she, she ended up sustaining. I did end, end up having to push my surgery out one day but um, she was able to, to get to all of her patients as, as expected there. So that's, that's sort of my story. And I think it you know, was really enlightening um, for, for me just to kind of help me see, no, yeah, this is right. This is what I need. How about you, Karen? And for me, uh, I think that if a person, I don't know, I can't imagine ever not thinking twice. And what I guess what I'm trying to say by that is I just um, I think that if you're a mature adult who uh, has, you know, a somewhat realistic point of view, even if you're oftentimes more optimistic than you are realistic, um, you think about like, is this something I really want to do? And, and I think that's important that you consider all the possibilities and determine whether or not is this something I really want to do and question that. So I think that was more what I did versus like a feeling of, am I going to regret this? Because once I made decisions to, this is what I'm going to do, I was pretty hundred percent, like not wanting to back out of it by any means. Uh, just more of a, is it going to be positioned? If we're talking about bottom surgery, surgery specifically, it was like, is it going to be positioned how, how I've been wearing a prosthetic packer? Because if not, then that's, I don't know. So the kind of questioning in terms of like my expectation versus what reality was going to be, um, was more of some of my like hesitation, if you will. Um, but like I said, I have no regrets because even after having that a bit of a horrific infection in my leg, I still, the day after it got better said, yep, I'd do that again to, have my my new friend down there. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a you know, big takeaway here. And it's, it's something I hear from a lot of people that, that have the procedures is that, yeah, it's it sucks. It's a lot of work. It's a lot of pain. It's a lot of recovery. But 
you know, my life is so much better for it. And, you know, I'd, I'd do it again <laughs> if I had to. I'm, I'm glad I don't, uh, <laughs> but I would do it again. <laughs> All right, let's take a look at the next one here. Uh, okay, so this is more a question for me. Uh, how disruptive was dilating to your professional life and did you ever consider a zero depth option? So uh, really quick summary of zero depth. There is an option that a lot of surgeons offer where instead of constructing uh, a full depth uh, vaginal canal, they will actually just do uh, zero depth, which is which is no canal, but the external appearance is is what you'd expect um, for for a vulva. Uh, for me personally, it was not something I I really considered. Uh, obviously, with the zero depth option, there there is less work and it's a faster recovery because it's less invasive. Uh, but for me, uh, you know, being able to uh, experience things a certain way was was important, uh, which is why I did opt for for the the full depth option in surgery. Uh, dilating itself is, is sort of a chore, uh, especially out of surgery uh, when you first start that routine. Depending on your surgeon, you're going to be dilating somewhere between four, six, seven times a day for 15, 20 minutes. And that just consumes a lot of time because although you're, you're only dilating for, for 15 minutes, right? Uh, but there's, you know, you got to prepare a, a bed to, to lie down on while you dilate. Um, you know, you're, you're immobilized, you have to get all your supplies together. You know, there's, there's lubricant, uh, towels, and uh, put a bed sheet or a bed protector sheet down so you don't, you know, make a mess. It, it takes time, right? So especially at first, when you're first starting the process, it's, uh, it's probably going to take you 30 to 60 minutes for those early sessions there to kind of get the hang of it. Uh, so from a work perspective, yeah, that that was really disruptive. And like I mentioned, I, I did have about six weeks off of work to kind of get through the bulk of the uh, really heavy dilation. And then by the, I went back to work when I was dilating three times a day. And I, I really just tried to schedule it like right bookends around work uh, and then late, late at night, right? So like first thing when I woke up, right when I got back home and then right before bed. Um, and try to work my, my work schedule around that as much as possible. It's it's not ideal. It's not fun. And it, it just, you know, like I said, it eats all of your time to, to first start. Uh, the good news is, though, that um, as time goes on, uh, you have to dilate less and less. And now that I'm a year post-op, um, the recommendation is like once a week. Uh, of course, you know, check with your particular surgeons for, for what they recommend. But um, it does become less of a, a hassle over time. But yeah, those first six months in particular are just kind of a pain uh, from a time standpoint. You just are always doing it. <laughs> so not very fun. <laughs> yeah, I don't All know. All right, so let's see what we got here. Yeah, I, <laughs> it's it's not great. Um, okay, um, I are you able to orgasm like, after surgery? Like, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say I have to... Uh, stick a catheter. Uh, uh, it's more of a just like rubber tubing through the end of my phallus, which I don't have any feeling in. So I think a lot of guys or folks hear that and they just think, oh, you have to put where? Um, but, I, but I don't have any feeling or sensation right now. And so the reason I have to stick the tubing through there and have it come out the new urethral hole uh, is to to keep it clear so that when I do have stage two, there's hopefully uh, less likelihood of a fistula or stricture because that urethra is, you know, dilated and cleared out and what have you. I have to do that at least once a day. There's no time to it. It's so there just, is some maintenance there. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so for, for this question, I, I did talk about this a little no bit already. Pain. Yes. Well, that's, yeah, <laughs> at least you can't feel it. <laughs> right. But that's for the I orgasm I question here, I did, <laughs> I had my first orgasm about uh, six weeks after surgery, uh, which is basically the, the first chance they say that you can start kind of exploring down there again. And um, yeah, uh, everything seems to work about as you'd expect. And, you know, something I get asked every once in a while too, is it's like, well, you know, how does it, can you tell like feeling down there? Can you tell what it used to be or anything like that? And and the reality is not, not really. Everything just feels like 
that's how it was always supposed to be. Your, your body is, is pretty good at kind of remapping how everything's laid out. Um, so, you know, some people report phantom pains. And I, I will say that like right after surgery, in those first couple of weeks, there were some like phantom itching pains um, as the nerves are starting to reconnect. And, and those itches felt like they were in places that no longer existed. So I guess there were some of those phantom uh, feelings, but but they resolved pretty quickly for me. And like I said, my body did a really good job of, or my mind did a really good job of kind of remapping where the nerves were and, and everything just sort of felt right. And for me, um, I mentioned earlier, my phallus doesn't have any feeling and likely won't, um, even if it has a few pings and zaps as nerves are reconnecting, that's not likely to come for somewhere around four to six months um, and might not have full feeling, feeling in it until nine months to a year or more. And so in terms of being able to orgasm, uh, my you know, uh, natal anatomy is, is still there. And so, because like I said before, in stage one, at least with Dr. Burley, it's just the creation of the phallus. So in terms of other parts of my body that I was born with, uh, I am able to uh, orgasm. And um, I probably did that sooner than I was supposed to. <laughs> so don't listen to your surgeon. Um, but uh, because it is not uh, something that gets like, buried is the term that a lot of folks use in stage one um, and full functioning to have that sensation still be there. So it's no different, I guess, is what I'm trying right. to say, at least not two months in. For me. Right. All right. Next question from the audience. Did your surgery fall short, meet or exceed your expectations of validity post-op? I think validity is an interesting word to see there. Um, I, again, for, for trans individuals, when we just, you know, for, for those of us that do undergo, uh, these procedures, there, there is that, um, euphoria that comes with having our body aligned better with, with what our mind, um, expects our body to look like. Um, so, I mean, I mean, the, what I'm trying to say is the surgery of course, doesn't make anyone more or less valid. Um, but for me personally, it was, you know, very important in my journey, in my transition, in feeling more complete and feeling more comfortable with who I am. And I would say that my, my expectations were, were exceeded. You know, I wasn't a huge fan of the recovery. It's, it's a long, arduous recovery, but you know, at this point, almost a year after surgery, um, it, it's amazing just how, how freeing that is. And, uh, you know, for, for individuals who, who do need this procedure as part of their journey, I, I hope they have similar experiences as well. Uh, but for me, yeah, this was, it was life-changing and a very positive life change. And I think for me, Samantha, each stage will be kind of like a building block to feeling more uh, validity, if you will, just at least in my own, you know, what makes me feel uh, most complete. And what I mean by that is, you know, with stage one, it's like, all right, I have a penis. It's a wonderful feeling. Uh, and then looking forward to stage two is when I will be able to stand to pee. And so while on one hand, I'm super grateful and excited that I have my new friend, I can't, I have to still sit to pee. So there's still kind of some of that like social and bathroom dysphoria, um, uh, personally that I have. Some guys may choose to have this procedure done and not have their urethra lengthened and they still sit to pee even though they have a, a penis and that's teach their own. But for me, you know, this stage, excitement for the penis, <laughs> stage two will be excitement to stand to pee. And then stage three, which I plan to do, uh, is going to be uh, testicle implants and an erectile device. And so with each stage, it kind of compounds for me personally to, I guess, have more excitement and um, feel more complete in my journey. Um, so it's, so it's, it's good on one hand that it's exciting with each stage. Um, but I think until that third stage is when I'll finally feel as if like, oh gosh, I don't have, there's nothing to look forward to. 
uh, which is good because <laughs> <laughs> right, I, you know, I keep feeling like. And I will say, something. at this point in my transition, I'm I I'm done with surgeries, right? Um, and just that feeling of being done is incredible. <laughs> Because I mean, so much of this process is waiting, right? We we just wait around, we wait around, we wait around for for these surgery dates to come, and um, to just finally be able to not have to watch the calendar anymore and be able to go on with my life is it's a big relief. So I I, I feel that for you, and I can't wait for you, for you to wrap up your your procedures there as well with your your stages coming up. Thanks, I'm really happy for you. All right, let's take a look at our next question. How much did you spend on your surgery and did insurance cover any of the costs? It's it's actually kind of hard for me to even put a total on it. Um, I, well, it's not that hard because I just did my taxes for this year. <laughs> but um, my healthcare plan, I do have insurance for my work and it does cover transition related uh, or, or it covered this procedure. It doesn't cover all trans procedures, but it did cover uh, this procedure we've been talking about here tonight. Um, however, it's a high deductible healthcare plan. So I actually had to hit my out-of-pocket max um, before it was completely covered. So um, I ended up paying somewhere around $6,500 out-of-pocket for the surgery. Uh, but then on top of that, I also had to spend uh, about a thousand dollars for a studio Airbnb in the area to stay at uh, during uh, recovery. I also had to buy a plane ticket for myself and for Laura. She, she was out there helping me recover, uh, and of course, food um, and everything else while you're out there as well. So, total cost for for the procedure for me was you know maybe just shy of of ten thousand dollars out of pocket, and that was with insurance, uh, which is crazy. But this is unfortunately for for us in the U.S. This is sort of a, a normal thing we deal with. Um, the the funny thing is, I actually got the the official bill from from the hospital, <laughs> and I think my total cost for for the procedure, the hospital stay, uh, was somewhere around one hundred and twenty thousand dollars, which is insanity. And now, of course, um, for people who are paying out of pocket, you, you'd never pay that much money. That's just an internal document there, but. Uh, just wild to see that that's sort of a number associated with a procedure. Yeah, and don't get mad at me, Samantha. Uh, but <laughs> I, uh, I, I'm very blessed and grateful that my insurance covered uh, all. It was 123,600 and something. It was outrageous, similar to yours, at least uh, for stage one. And my uh, copay for that was $250. Um, so I wow. gladly dollars <laughs> again for that. Now I did, of course, need to buy some supplies. That was maybe around three hundred dollars, but uh, we were grateful that we lived so close to the hospital because I was able to, uh, when I was released from the hospital, just come home to recover. Uh, whereas I know when people have to travel, they have to have somewhere to stay, whether that be an Airbnb or um, other, you know, housing arrangements but our housing arrangement was just to come home and so yep it was 250. no oh, around 500 <laughs> if you count like supplies that's that's not bad um but no, it is i mean the good news is bad. that there are companies out there there are insurance companies that are offering better more inclusive trans health care uh something interesting we actually had uh, a viewer of the show provide a copy of, of their medical bill as well uh, in regards to, to their bottom surgery. So here, here's an actual photo uh, here. And uh, their, their out-of-pocket payment was $20. So <laughs> I'm going to pop in here with some not, more not details. Bad for, uh, this is from uh, yeah, someone I follow on Instagram. Her name's uh, Madeline. And it was a $20 copay or something and then she also said that there was a 250 fifty dollar hospital uh deductible or something like that but 270 dollars is just you know really good yeah that's an awesome rate you know something that comes up a lot too in these conversations around cost like how do you afford surgery like this um you know definitely doing research with your your workplaces or for jobs to see if they are trans inclusive with their health care can go a long way and uh, I know for a lot of younger people too, another option is that a lot of universities offer uh, health 
plans uh, through the school as well. And more and more of those universities are also offering trans-inclusive healthcare coverage. So for, for those younger trans people out there who are you know, starting to look at schools and things like that, um, it is possible to you know, schedule these surgeries through those type of plans. And I, I know someone personally who, who had their surgery through a university plan. So uh, those are our best options, you know, unless you're independently wealthy um, or are saving for a long time. You know, procedures are, are unfortunately not cheap. Um, so a good health care plan is beneficial to getting through these. Yeah, I certainly wouldn't have been able to do it if I didn't have the good insurance. So yeah. thankful. And of course, that isn't fair. Um, it's not fair at all. Um, there, there's, the, these procedures are, are just as life-saving as, uh, you know, any uh, surgery to, for a heart attack or for a broken leg, right? It's, the, these are life-saving surgeries. There's still quite a bit of work to do in the public understanding of, uh, you know, trans-related healthcare. So hopefully there, there, maybe there's someone watching right now out there from a healthcare company who's debating whether or not they need to cover uh, trans-related surgeries. Uh, do it, you'd save some lives. All right, let's take a look at our next one here. Of all the surgeries you've had, which was the most difficult for you? Cameron? I, um, I guess in the sense that I ended up with that infection for a few days and there was just so much back and forth uh, with going to the hospital um, this is this most recent one has been the most difficult, but again, I also uh, I'm very grateful and thankful for it, and would do it all over again. So while it was most difficult, it wasn't so difficult that I regret it by any means. Yeah, I think I mean the my bottom surgery was was by far the hardest. Um, in comparison, the other surgeries really don't uh, compare. And I, I think that the hardest part for me about it was just the chronic pain, um, not being able to sit down for like a month just because of, of how sore and tender everything was down there. And it's, it's really hard to prepare for that. Like, by the way, you're going to be in pain for, um, you know, like 35 days straight. And it's like, oh my gosh. How, how do you prepare for it? You just sort of have to, you know, work your way through it. Uh, so yeah, that was by far the, the hardest procedure that I had. All right, let's take a look at our next question here. Is it smarter to transition or go to college first? I, I hate that it has to even come to that. I hate that somebody has to choose between going to college or, or using that money to pay for uh, transition. I, I mean, that's just such a, a disappointment in in the healthcare system here, uh, in the U.S. If, if you are in the U.S., um, but uh, you know, hopefully the the schools you're looking at, uh, maybe you can find a school that does have that trans inclusive healthcare package, like I was mentioning earlier, and and maybe you can do both. So I would definitely look into that. And, and see if you can you can find a, a plan that can help you and support you. And and usually those university healthcare plans are you know very aware that college students don't have a lot of funds and their copays are extremely reasonable. So that's that's my hope is that you're able to find a, a solution that allows you to get your education but also take care of yourself. Yeah, when I saw that question, my thought was why not both? Um, but if it's a money center, uh, lack of insurance, I, I jokingly but seriously also would suggest uh, move to Oregon or other states who their uh, their statewide health plan, like in Oregon, it's called the Oregon Health Plan. It covers trans uh, related surgeries or gender affirming surgeries. And so how much the copay ends up being um, and exactly how much it covers, I'm not certain. But I do have a buddy and he he, um, you know, works part time. So his part, his two different part time jobs don't offer him insurance. And so due to his uh, 
I don't know how to say this in a nice way. I'm just going to say it. his lack of income. He qualifies for the Oregon health plan and, and the Oregon health plan again, covers those surgeries. And so if you were a student and you weren't, you didn't have a career, you didn't make a full-time uh, wage, then you could qualify for something like an Oregon, the Oregon health plan. Other states may offer something similar. I don't know. Mm -hmm. There are a few other ones out there that have similar plans. All right, let's take a look at our next one. Uh, what was the hardest adjustment after surgery? Hmm. <laughs> you know, I there there weren't a lot of hard adjustments for me. Um, I, I want to say really that I mean, yeah, I was in pain. Surgery is painful. Recovery is painful. I, I think it was actually harder for for Laura. Uh, while I was recovering, because I was, you know, incapacitated for that that period, and not just for for uh, bottom surgery, but for my other procedures as well. Um, yeah, there she is, there supporting me at the hospital. Um, but she she had to take care of me uh, coming out of surgery, and it's not just me at our house. We have our our four sons as well. So I think that was extremely hard on her to to have to support me through these procedures while running the house, and you know I I will forever be grateful for, for her doing that. Um, but it was not easy. Um, I'm glad I don't have to put her in that situation again anytime soon. How about you, Cameron? I, uh, my wife and I do a pretty good job of divide, divide and conquer in terms of like household duties. And so knowing that she was going to have to do everything, um, I felt guilty and bad um, that I had to just lie down for four weeks. And so um, the difficult thing for me was knowing that I, as much as I wanted to get up and vacuum the house or go clean out the litter box or take the dogs on a walk, I couldn't, um, was what was difficult for me is that, like you said with uh, your partner, Laura, is like knowing that they have to do everything for us uh, makes it tough. Yeah. And just made me like, can I just somehow fast forward time so that I can walk and do things and so she doesn't have to do everything for me including like make all my meals and you know do everything for our, our daughter um and in laura she had you know four times that you know <laughs> with your four <laughs> children versus with one so kudos to her and to my wife heather um yeah it's important to have a someone that you could rely on and count on as a caregiver um yeah. They're saints for, for the work they did. Yeah, for sure. All right, let's take a look here. Uh, did you consider continue seeing a therapist after surgery? So when I read this question, I, I picture that as like a, a mental health therapist. Is, is that how you saw it, Cameron? <laughs> um, yeah, but now that you say that, I'm thinking, oh, did they mean like some type of physical therapy? But when I saw it, I right? Yeah, it I, I mean, it, I can go either way. Yeah, but I, I construed it as mental health, and um, something we we both touched on. We didn't really go into in any extreme depth, but um, there is the WPATH guidelines for for transition uh, and transitional care. Uh, Cameron, we we talked about your letters that you had to get. I had to do the same over here. Um, there, there's a process to going through transition. You can't just go out and get surgery. There are many visits. You're going to see at least two therapists. You've got your own MD who's going to write you a letter at some point. Um, so there are a lot of checks and balances in there. And, and seeing a therapist is, is usually a part of that process. Um, I will say that after bottom surgery, I, I still continue to see my therapist. I think it's pretty cathartic to see a therapist on a regular basis and pretty helpful. Um, whether or not it's because of um, dysphoria or, or other reasons, uh, I have continued to see a therapist over here as well. And I just went to the therapist for the sake of getting the letters. Um, and, uh, <laughs> while I don't think it's a bad thing to see a therapist, I don't. Uh, but I did have to see an occupational therapist for the rehabilitation of my wrist and hand and forearm. Uh, and I still am seeing him even now that I'm uh, two months post-op. I start, I've been seeing him weekly for the last, I think I've seen him three or four times now. And now we've gone to every other week. And here when I see him in two weeks, he said we might even go to once a month or 
stop. I might have I might have enough mobility that he just says I don't have to come anymore. So um, I, when I say I don't go to therapy, it's not because I don't think it's important for folks to go to therapy. I just I just don't. There you go. And everyone has different needs, right? I mean, if you don't have a need for therapy, I'm not going to say you have to go to therapy. That's just a waste of everyone's time. But uh, I still get a lot out of mine. I was going to say, I think all of us as human beings could benefit from it. <laughs> My wife would tell you I could probably go to a therapist, but I just <laughs> to, you know, watch YouTube videos, listen to audiobooks and podcasts and, and call that my therapy. <laughs> there you go. All right, let's pull up our, our next question here. And this is an important question, I think. If I like my body as it is, does that mean I'm not transgender? Ooh. I'll let you go first. Uh, you, okay, so I've, I've, I think I've made my opinion on this pretty pretty clear, um, is that there's there's no right way to trans, right? And I, I, I say that as a, as a, you know, as a trans person, there's no requirements, there's no book on how to do this right. The only, you know, thing that I'm concerned about is that, you know, I'm getting what I need for, for my own journey and that other individuals are getting what they need for their journeys. And if you are comfortable with your body as it is, that's awesome. Um, you know, it's, it's a, that's a beautiful thing to be comfortable in your own skin. Um, the fact that I needed these procedures to, to be comfortable in my skin, that was how my story panned out for me. But um, I, I think at the end of the day, the important thing is that you're comfortable with yourself and the need or, or want uh, for surgeries or, or go undergoing surgeries has no impact on whether or not you're uh, transgender or not. I think our stories are our own and we need to remember that and advocate for ourselves. Okay, I couldn't have said it any better. So if you want to move on to the next question, we can. <laughs> Is that it? We're just going to drop mic. We're out of here. We're good. Boom. Yeah, I don't have anything to add to that. All right. I think that was the last pre-submitted question. So I do want to bring Addison on and see how the chat's going tonight. Yeah, so we had two questions. Uh, the first question is from Lauren Jo. She asks, after gender confirmation surgery, when you stopped taking Spiro, did you notice a change in your ability to control your weight? Uh, she referred to it as uh, the Spiro munchies. <laughs> so there, yeah, uh, a known side effect of being on spironolactone is that you crave salt. Uh, you you are like driven to, to consume more salt. Uh, and usually that comes in the form of carbs, <laughs> right? Like pretzels and, and other salty treats. Um, so coming off of, of Spiro was sort of a interesting experience. I, I definitely have less cravings now than I did before when it comes to salt in particular, but I also created a lot of bad habits <laughs> while I was on it. So prior to starting it, I never put salt on anything. Uh, and then while I was on it, I started putting salt on everything. And I mean, I was I was even putting salt on things that were already salty. Like I'd, I'd make a bowl of uh, like the cup of noodles, the the ramen, which is already like 80% sodium. And it's like, well, this could use a little more salt. I'm not even joking. I, I actually did that. I added more salt to ramen. Um, so I don't do that anymore, but I do use more salt in my day-to-day -day life than I, than I did prior to uh, <laughs> starting. <laughs> Okay, and we did have one other question. This is from Erica Foreman. Uh, she wanted to know if you could talk about breast augmentation. I think we, maybe we skipped that when we were talking about your surgery, Samantha. Oh yeah, I, I did skip it. So I, I was going through transition or surgeries chronologically, and then I stopped at GCS. I the last procedure I had was actually my my BA. So uh, I just had that in November. What was the actual question she she had, Addison? It was literally just like, you know, talk about it, tell her a little bit about it. So BA is, I mean, in comparison to, to what we spent most of the night here talking about is a walk in the park. Um, you know, here's a picture of me getting unwrapped uh, about three days after surgery. And um, it's, it's fairly straightforward as, as surgeries go. Um, from an impact standpoint, oh, look, me waking up and being happy that it was done. <laughs> 
Um, you, you do experience some discomfort after surgery. Uh, for me, the implants were done under the muscles. So there, there was some pain associated with the incisions that they, they had to uh, put in there. Um, and you are limited in your mobility slightly, you know, no lifting anything over 10 pounds for the first six weeks. Um, it's going to be difficult for you to get a shirt on over your head or a top on over your head for that first week or two till you start loosening back up again. So there, there is um, some recovery that you're, you're going to go through there. But I'd say from a impact standpoint, by about two weeks after, I was feeling pretty good. I, I think I took five days off of work. For, for BA versus six weeks uh, for, for bottom surgery. So if, if that puts it into com you know comparison there from uh, you know how long are you gonna be out after this procedure, uh, there it is. <laughs> okay, and that was it from the chat. Back to you guys. All right. Well, Cameron, I think this has been our longest episode so far, but we covered a ton of stuff here tonight. This was a really awesome conversation. I apologize. Like I said at the beginning, if you don't tell me that's enough, Cameron, then I could just talk and talk and talk. So <laughs> no, this was good, though. We, we hit so many good topics. We covered a lot of important ground out there. And I know there are people watching who are, you know, scheduled to have these procedures in the future. And I hope we hear from some of the people that have also had these surgeries so that they can kind of chime in and provide their input as well. Uh, again, these are our stories, these are our experiences, but for, for people that are looking to have surgery in the future, you need to take all of these experiences together. You need to talk to as many people as possible before you go under the knife. You know, we, we have to do that research. We have to make sure we're, we're making the best choices for us because ultimately if, if things don't go the way we wanted, you know, it's, it, it comes back to our, our decision to go forward with it. So I think it's important that we, we have these chats. We are open. I think the work that you're doing, sharing your story is fantastic. Um, if you don't already follow Cameron on Instagram, he's on there as trans swag. And he is also on YouTube, same name, trans swag. And he has documented, I, I think you've got two years of videos up there. Now you've documented so much of your transition. And I think that's such an important resource to the community. Thank you so much for, for continuing to do your, uh, your show. Uh, I think it's great. Thank you. And I, I really appreciate what you're doing with uh, trans IRL. It's, uh, it's, it's actually my, I would love to do, but, um, don't make the time. I'm not going to say I don't have the time. I don't make the time. So, uh, but now that I know that you're doing that, I, I don't have to, so I could just thank you and praise you and tell people <laughs> to come watch your show. Um, and what I mean by that is when I started trans swag, uh, the swag is an acronym, the show with awesome guys. And I wanted to share the, the trans masculine experience and initially started with like some guests sharing their stories, but then with work and family, and I know you understand this, Samantha, and maybe you too, <laughs> Addison, uh, it's it's hard to, to make it happen. And so I stopped that and just kind of focused on sharing my own experience, um, but have thought, I hope eventually there's a show where they share folks from all over the, the spectrum of gender uh, however they identify and it sounds like that's what you're doing so thank you for doing that and thank you for having me on thank you it's, it's a labor of love and we really enjoy putting the show on and we've got some great guests lined up here over the next couple weeks speaking of which let's take a moment to talk about our guests next week uh we are going to be covering a topic that is going to be one of our most difficult subjects yet and that's one that affects a lot of people in transition as well and that's religion so please join me uh, or join me in the discussion with uh, Abby Stein. Uh, she is a trans activist and a Jewish educator. And we're gonna hear some of her incredible story, including her journey from being an ultra Orthodox Jewish rabbi to an out and proud trans woman. So I know we're gonna have a lot of questions out there. I know we're gonna have a lot to talk about. I think it's gonna be a fantastic episode. Uh, with her schedule, um, she's very busy. Um, we're, we're so honored that she is gonna make time for us. And she's gonna be talking to us live from Australia next week. So uh, forgive us if we, we are running a few minutes late. We're, we're gonna be working through some technical challenges or uh, probably our, our, our hardest broadcast yet, uh, having her on here live from Australia. Uh, please note that for next week's show, there is a time change with the time zone change that's happening here in the US. If you are on the, well, if you're here in the United States, 
Um, the time, the clocks changed this weekend, but I'm here in Arizona where the clocks don't change. Uh, so I'll continue broadcasting at 7.30 here in Arizona, but uh, West Coast viewers are gonna be watching us at 7.30 uh, and our East Coast is gonna be at 10.30. Um, so be, please be aware of those. I believe the times elsewhere in the world are unchanged. Hawaii is still the same because I don't do daylight savings. Just part of the joys of living out here in Arizona. <laughs> so let's bring everyone back on here really quick. And uh, I just want to say thanks again for everyone's help in, in working on the show here today. Thank you, Addison, for running everything in the background. Of course. And, uh, watching our chat. And Cameron, thank you again so much for your time and giving up some of your evening to share your story with us. Of course. Thank you. My pleasure. All right, everyone. So from all of us here at TransIRL, we'll see you next week.